My guest at this time is a former WCW and WWE Tag Team Champion. It is Chuck Palumbo. Chuck, thank you very much for taking the time to chat with me here today. Oh, you're very welcome. Thanks thanks for having me, man. I appreciate it. Well, brother, like, first of all, how are you feeling, man? Like, it's the light at the end of the tunnel here. Life is seemingly going to get back to normal. What's your, what's your state of mind like these days? You know, I was talking to some other guys. I, it, the COVID deal hasn't affected me personally as much as, you know, someone might think. I've been just going about my business and doing what I do. Yeah, uh, lumber prices have went up <laughs> dramatically, but um, yeah, I've been you know nothing. Honestly, um, me personally, it really hasn't affected me that much. Thankfully, um, my family's healthy, my friends are healthy, and um, yeah, I've just been going about my business. So, talk to me. What is what is what is Chuck Palombo up to these days? What what is your business at the moment, Chuck? So I, I have I'm into multiple things. I have a lot of irons in the fire. But um, I do everything from home renovations to home flips oh, wow. um, to uh, still do the, the car building and the motorcycle building. So uh, I work with my hands a lot. I'm in the trades a lot. Um, so, yeah, if I'm not working in the shop on a project, then I'm, I'm working on a, on a property. Uh, so, so yeah, you, you, you bring up how you, you work in all these different trades. Yeah. I guess that kind of ties in here. We can start off. You got this new YouTube channel, Chuck of all trades. Sure. Yeah. What, what yeah. is it about? That's my, that's my little baby. That's my little project. Um, and it's just, it's simple, um, you know, raw. And I just, basically it just captures me and what I do on a daily basis. Right now, the project I'm working on is, is a home restoration from a, a home here in San Diego built in 1924. Oh, um, complete. I like to call it a restoration. We, you know, we brought it down to the studs and rebuilt it. Um, and then I built a shop, a steel building, a new shop on that property too. Um, and eventually, uh, next year, we will film another car show, cars and motorcycles inside that shop. Oh, so I'm getting that outfitted now for next year. And then we'll do another show um, featuring the, uh, the projects, the cars, the motorcycles, anything, anything we decide to build. Sure. And so, are, so, I mean, this sounds like uh, kind of like a pilot. Are, like, are you wanting to wind up on like Discovery, flipping houses, building motors? So I had a show um, on, I had a couple different shows on Discovery for a few years. Yeah. Um, and that was fun, but I'm not sure. That's really not the way I want to, I want to do this. Uh, I just, I really want to just keep it raw and show people what I do. Um, I don't really want to have the per se entertainment side of it brought into it. On, on this um that stuff's fun but at the same time it's when you when you're doing real things like building and stuff like that and then you bring in the entertainment aspect to it yes they they can be fun but i think it dilutes what what we're doing so if that makes any sense um i want to keep it more more real so we'll okay. see if something comes up i would explore the opportunity but um I just want to share my my knowledge and skills with people. Um, hopefully, people watch it and go, oh, you know, maybe I'd like to try that. Or I've been thinking about doing that. Um, so if I can inspire a few people and share my projects and, and share my talents, that, that's fantastic. Well, one of the last major runs I think a lot of people remember for you in WWF, uh, you had kind of taken on this mechanic persona. I know I can kind of work out. I'm working a little out of order here, but like, right. that, was that something that you came to them with? Was this just like an extension of your personality? And this was something you decided you were going to start making part of your wrestling persona? Yeah. So I, at the time, um, I, I want to say I was, I had built this motorcycle that was featured in a magazine. Right. And I was talking to Vince and I showed him and he said, well, why aren't we doing, why aren't we doing this? <laughs> and I said, well, you know, it never came up. Um, and that's how it all kind of started. Okay. Um, I started doing vignettes, stuff like that. And, you know, it, it, I didn't want, it was an extension of who I was per se. Right. Sure. The motorcycles, working on bikes, wrenching, stuff like that. So, um, yeah, that's basically it. You know, a lot of the idea, you know, a lot of the ideas in wrestling, they happen with, you know, in seconds. Oh, let's do this. And next thing you know, you're done. I mean, that quick. Well, <laughs> nothing's I... ever, pl nothing's planned out. You know how it goes. 
Sure. Well, I know that Vince is like a big motorcycle guy. I've talked he to is. I I know I've talked to Godfather about it and a, a couple other folks about it. So yeah. so were you and Vince like friendly in that regard? Like was he interested? Did you guys ever ride bikes together or anything like that? We never rode bikes together, but we but we you know lived on opposite side of the countries, but we were always friendly. Yeah. He, he's always been very friendly to me. Um always had an open door policy with me. We we spoke a lot. Um he always treated me very well. Very cool. Um, well, yeah, I mean, just kind of to back up just a little bit here, uh, I, I enjoyed getting to dig into your story before we got to talk here today, Chuck. One of the things I thought was really interesting was before you were into wrestling, you were actually you served in the Navy for a while. Is that correct? I did. I did. I did uh, four years in the Navy. Man, that's that's quite a that's quite a chunk of time uh, to be spending enlisted there. Uh, what was it like for you in the military uh, for in the, to be in the Navy? And like, did that help you prepare at all for what was to come when you would become a professional wrestler? Absolutely. Well, you know, adversity, right? Yeah. So um, making that transition from a, I'd say a, a citizen or a civilian to, to an enlisted military person, it's a big transition. Um, obviously, you know, you go through boot camp, but um, then you go out and, and you do your job. But um, yeah, I, uh, 91, I enlisted late 91 um, at the time, still living in Rhode Island. Um, I wanted to go out to California okay. and that was my ticket out to California, joined the Navy, sent me to San Diego for boot camp. Um, after boot camp in San Diego, um, they sent me up to central California, uh, the San Joaquin Valley area base called Lemoore. Uh, I was a, actually, I ended up to back it up a bit. They sent me to school first. I was a uh, aviation mechanic. Oh, okay. And ha you know, having the mechanical background, it worked. So I became an aviation mechanic. Um, they sent me to my first squadron. I started working on the FA-18. Oh. At the time, it was the uh, C and D models. That squadron decommissioned. Uh, then I went down to San Diego. And then, uh, you know, the Top Top Gun show, that movie Top Gun? I'm familiar that with it. Okay, so that base, I was, at, I was stationed at that base in Miramar. And what I would do was six months a year, my squadron would be stationed there and then the other six months i would my squadron would fly out and we would stay on the uss carl vinson which is an air uh, nuclear powered aircraft carrier and I, I would go out to the gulf i'd go out to the gulf for six months work on that i worked on the flight deck as a plane captain um, and then we'd come back at the end of that six month uh deal be home for six months and then go back out that sounds really hard chuck i spend that much time <laughs> on the boat away from everybody that seems like mentally taxing that was probably the biggest struggle for me, I think, was probably being out at sea for that long. Yeah. You know, you go into ports here and there, but you'll be out at sea for six, seven, eight weeks at a time. Um, and, you know, that can get that can get tough. But, you know, great life experience. Um, obviously, working hard, there's never a day off unless you're in port. So you do 12 hour shifts. Um, obviously, you're working on the flight deck, a very high risk job. But you know, it's it's one of those it's one of those life builders, right? And um, I don't want to sound like a recruiting commercial, but at the same time, it kind of prepares you um, for 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 what's next in life. You know, it's a good stepping stone. Do they play that song in the Navy every day on the boat? Or no? <laughs> Can you imagine? No, please no. <laughs> okay, never mind. Please no. So you have guys jumping off the deck. So. <laughs> sorry sorry so anyway okay. so so you pivot out of the navy into pro wrestling and like the way that i saw it was like you find this listing or whatever for the power plant like were you always wanting to be a pro wrestler or was like this more of a spur of the moment decision like what what led to this pivot here? so i t i tend to do everything backwards in life i don't know why. i just kind of follow my gut right so just to rewind a little bit high school i was a basketball player in high school right i was um getting i, I was an all-state player um i was getting offers to play at colleges but at the time i did not want to go to school nor just to put it plainly did i have the grades i did the bare minimum to get by in school in high school so that wasn't going to happen um at the time home life wasn't great and really i needed a place to live <laughs> to tell you the truth so my, me and my brother. So that's where the Navy came into play. Okay. I was working. I was already working in an auto body. I was an auto body painter. Um, I had learned, like I said, I'd, I'd known the trade since I was a young kid. 
since my early teens, but I needed a place, uh, a roof over my head and a steady job with benefits. And that's why I joined the Navy. Plus I wanted to get out of Rhode Island. Uh, not a lot of opportunity, beautiful place, but not a lot of opportunity. Wanted to come out to California. So that's why I joined the Navy. While I'm in the Navy, I start playing basketball again on the base team and in local club leagues. And I ended up um, recruit somehow, I don't know how it happened. I think I went to a tournament in Vegas. It was the Reebok uh, pump tournament, I believe. It's a recruiting tournament where a lot of players getting ready to go to college will go for some exposure. Um, ended up being seen by some different recruiters. And now I'm getting recruited out of the Navy to play basketball in college. So four years of the Navy goes by, I'm honorably discharged, ready to go to school. Going back to my grades, like I had told you, I just did the bare minimum to get by. So I went back to Rhode Island, went to a junior college for a year, uh, got my grades up. Um, I made uh, I made All-American in, in junior college, oh. ended up getting a full scholarship my freshman year in junior college um, to Central Missouri State University. It's a division two NCAA school. Um, that was it. While I'm in college um, in Missouri playing basketball, I see the ad on TV for the WCW power plant. Never, I've ne I, at that point, I'd never watched wrestling. What? I, mean, and I tell people all the time, I said, I knew, I knew who Hulk Hogan was. He was a household name, right? Sure. I might have known who the Macho Man was, the Slim Jim commercials, right? Um, but I didn't know anything about the business. I didn't know how much was, a, you know, work, how much was legit. But when I watched, uh, when I was flipping through the channels and I saw the show, what caught my eye was the athleticism. I saw these guys working in the ring. I'm like, wow, these guys are athletic. And then that ad comes up on TV. And I tell guys, said, uh, want to be a wrestler? With a question mark above. And then it said, join the WCW power plant where the big boys train. And I had a phone number. It was Atlanta, Georgia. And basically I called the phone number and I remember, I think it was Jody. Now going back, it was, I think Jody Hamilton, the guy who ran it, the original assassin, Nick Patrick's dad. Yeah. The referee. Yeah. He said, Oh, so uh, are you an athlete kid? I said, well, yeah. I said, I'm playing basketball in college right now. He goes, Oh, you want to be a wrestler? And I said, well, uh, yeah sure why not yeah <laughs> oh yeah so, so he says well uh, get 300 bucks and uh come down here and we'll uh we'll put you through a tryout just get yourself a uh, physical first and sign the waiver we'll send you the information so at that time there's no email or anything like that right so um i get my forms my waiver my forms in the in the mail i get the tryout dates i choose one and i go down Man, I go through the three day tryout. I don't know if you've heard about the tryouts they were having back then. I, I, I'm real. I'm actually really interested because like right now, the big thing is the WWE Performance Center. And kind of one of the things I wanted to ask you about is how, yeah. was, the, how was the power plant? Yeah. What was the training like down there? The, the tryout? I've never been to the performance center, but yeah. I can assume that it was completely different. Back in those days, it was very hard to get in the business. Right. You had to know someone, be second or third generation, things like that. Um, so this was basically a weeding out process and they were trying out anywhere from 25 to 30 guys a month. And for three days, if you made it to three days, they were just basically just running you into the ground. Um, I'm sure a lot of the guys who went through it with me will agree. Now I'm not talking about the guys like the Goldbergs and guys like that who were brought in by friends and paid right away and, prep to be put on TV. I'm talking about guys who had wanted to be in the business with nobodies like myself and were just trying to break in. They tortured us. Man. Um, we had to go, you know, it was a nine to five job without pay. Initially we do the three days. If you make it through the three days, they invite you back. Well, there's a chance they'll invite you back to be trained. So I made it through the three days. I was the only guy to make it through three days on that tryout. They, uh, <laughs> you know, it was, it was a trip. So, they tell me, okay, well, uh, you made it. Nice job. You know, I'm like, okay. And I'm waiting, you know, what comes next? They're like, well, what do you want to do? And I'm like, what do I want to do? I just went through three days of hell. <laughs> you tell me, is there a plan? Yeah. We have a plan. <laughs> and what did they say? Did they have a plan or were they just kind of like, oh, oh, no. no, no plan. Okay. Says, well, you know, uh, if you can get, get, get $3,000 together, what? Come, back, come, <laughs> come back 
and they will train you. What? So wait, it's three hundred bucks to do three days, and then they're like, "We need you to get three thousand dollars, and then we'll let you start continuing to work to maybe getting paid eventually." Yeah, that sounds. I mean, I'm glad well, it worked out for you, Chuck, but that doesn't sound necessarily like the the best strategy uh, for no, wrestlers. Yeah, not at all. But when you're naive, when you're young and naive, you sometimes you'll take these risks. Yeah, right. Sure. And the the, the ad, I remember the ad. And it was always in the back of my mind. There's a possibility after six months, you may receive a six figure contract. So I'm thinking six figure contract. And I'm a young, I'm a young guy, right? Six figure contract. I've never seen six figures in my life. Okay. I grew up in a very middle to lower class income family. So I'm just thinking, Oh man, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to make six figures and be on TV. I believed it. Yeah. And when you're naive like that at times, you'll move forward. And so I did it. I went back, had a one-year-old daughter at the time. Her mom, her and myself drive across country in an old Chevy Blazer with a U-Haul attached. I borrowed $3,000. It was a combination of different people. We drove across country. I show up at the school. I don't know where I'm going to live or anything like that. I ended up living in a, this, this ghetto hotel in Atlanta. Um, until uh, we were able to get enough money together to get an apartment, man, and that's how it started. So yeah, so uh, you you came in, I believe it's like ninety eight is like your first WCW appearance, but then really doesn't start getting going for you until about two thousand, right? And then you get thrown into the mix with the New Blood storyline and Lex Luger and all of that. How how was that for you? Finally being given something after spending all of this time. Uh, working yeah. and paying to get to that point. What did it feel like for you to finally be in the mix there with some of the big guys over at WCW? It was incredible. Yeah, it was incredible. You know, number one, now I got a, now I got a good job making excellent money, more money than I, you know, had ever dreamed of making. Um, number one, so now I can support my family. So that was big. And then number two, here I am working with these big, big names. Right, pretty much right away. Yeah. Very green. Yeah, dude. I, green. I, I was looking back and I was like, "Damn, Chuck got thrown like right into it, man." That's crazy. Yeah. And so I had to learn quick, and I learned on TV. Yeah. I mean, yeah, we did house. WCW didn't do a lot of house shows, so I worked independence as much as I could when I was training at the power plant. Me and a few of the other guys, we were we had a tight bond. Those natural born thriller guys. Yeah. We were very close. We hustled on the outside. We trained together. We ate together, and we did indies together. But, um. I had to learn quick. We didn't have the internet at the time. I mean, I guess the internet was out, but you couldn't go on and watch matches on YouTube and learn these different things. You had to find someone who had a, had a VHS, right? So you'd ask one of the old timers, hey, do you got any old tapes of uh, your stuff from back in you know, the 80s or whatever it was? And that's how you learned. And then on TV, you learned. And there's a lot to learn in the business, obviously everything from in the ring, but there's also a dynamic outside the ring, right? Yeah, there's 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 a code and there's a way to navigate through your career and it's uh, it's a lot to learn because there's some there are some characters in wrestling. It's a it's a silly it's um you know such an interesting business and you'll learn a lot. I learned so much. It's the best life experience you can have uh, or life tool you can acquire is is is, is learning how to navigate through wrestling. But um, at the same time, it's a crazy business, right? Some crazy characters. Yeah, for wow. sure. And and one of the things that was like, so you get, really get going in 2000, like you say, you're making good money and taking care of your family, but it was like only a year or so later than the WCW uh, folds, right? And gets sold to WWF. Uh, you were a yeah. part of, you were a part of WCW's final pay-per-view and yes. you were part of WCW's final Nitro. You were a part of both. What, yeah. What's your memories there of those kind of final days of WCW did you think that the, the company was in danger did you think it, that Bischoff was going to be buying it like what did you think was kind of going on there in those waning days of the company I'm very unsure I wasn't I wasn't sure I wasn't sure if Eric was going to buy it I wasn't sure if Vince was actually going to buy it I wasn't sure about anything until the night that Shane McMahon showed up in our locker room how was that how? I want to say it was Panama City Florida. it was Panama City yeah, yeah. absolutely yeah, yeah. I think him, him, Pritchard, and uh, Gerald Briscoe, I think, were the guys. That went okay, to yeah. WWF. Um, strange. Again, 
now I know they're, they're, they're definitely buying us, right? Shane shows up. So I know that, but I have no idea what's in store for us. I mean, because I know I've told other people, number one, am I going to have a job? Number two, if I, if they do retain me, what are they going to do with me? Right now you have double the roster, right? So, and you still, there's still only three hours of TV. Yeah. So so let's do the math. What are we going to do? So, um, but luckily again, I got, I was very fortunate that, um, they brought me in right away and started using me. And how, how different. So, well, a couple things real quick. And I know I only have a few more minutes with you, but how, how was the reception of the WWF guys in the locker room to the, the influx of WCW talent? Was there tension there when you came into the locker room or no? A lot of tension. WCW guys came in and made an attempt to befriend these guys. But the majority of them made it tough for us. You know, almost made it like, hey, you're coming into our house. and This is our home. And they took it personal when I think if they had bonded with us and we worked together, the business would have not went into the, the downfall that it went into a few years later. Yeah, because that 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 buyout didn't work. I mean, he did it, but let's just and I'm not knocking anybody. That's a you know, it was very hard. You know, for Vince to acquire that company, you know, kudos to him. But the product they started putting out, I mean, the ideas and the new blood and, you know, it it could have been so much more. It could have been so much more. They had a great opportunity to do huge things and it didn't work, you know. Yeah, I think, yeah, I mean, you look back on that and yeah, I think a lot of people agree more could have been done with that. How how, yeah. how different was uh, the corporate environment for you of WWF as, as compared as compared to, to WCW? Um, we knew less with, with WWF personally. Now, I'm not I can't speak for everybody. Right. The connection wasn't there. We call it the office. Mm-hmm. You refer to it as the corporate side or what have you. Um, I felt we felt disconnected. Didn't really know what was going on. Um, there was more of a separation there. On WCW, I felt like um, we had a better connection with the office, better idea on what was going on. Um, now that, that's just I can only speak for myself. But um, but yeah, now to go back to the, the you know the people that were there and, and and the connection and when I say those guys were standoffish, not everybody. Okay. Because there were some guys who were great, but in the beginning, a lot of you know, a lot of the guys were like, "Oh, you know, you know, what are you doing?" <laughs> the kind of "What are you doing here?" thing, you know. And it's like, "Oh, it's business, man. You know, <laughs> let's work, let's work together." Sure. But um, but yeah, great experience that'll never happen again. I was able to be a part of that, um, and that was that was crazy. Yeah, crazy and, times. And you know, obviously, you know, I don't have enough time to go through everything you did in WWF. I mean, full blooded Italians, the Billy and Chuck stuff. I mean, you were given several opportunities with WWF. Absolutely. Um, you left the company twice, once in two thousand four, then ultimately again, I think it was two thousand eight, two thousand nine, sometime in there. Why do you why did it ultimately why did you ultimately leave? Why did you think it not worked out for you in the end with WWF? Um the first time it really the first time it really wasn't my my choice i didn't want to but they weren't doing anything with me sure um they did for a while but then it got cut short the i thought the i mean uh, yeah you can give me your opinion but i thought the fbi stuff was good i love the fbi i mean it was different than the ecw version but yeah. I thought it was it was it was fun you know yeah. you guys say who didn't love you guys in nunzio i mean come on now, yeah you know? but you know in this business right it's kind of weird one or two persons one or two people, their opinion of you can often dictate your career. I've told people this from the past. One or two opinions of a person can dictate their career. Did that play a part? I don't know. But um, it wasn't working out for me at that point. Um, I went to Mexico City. I went to Japan. It was fantastic. And then they asked me to come back in 06. And I came back and for probably the first six months or so, I sat I sat at home. They didn't even use me. They paid me to sit at home. And then I finally started to use the, the motorcycle gimmick. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah. And I knew I signed a two-year deal in 06. 
I knew in my gut that that was going to be it for me. I didn't want to stay any longer than that unless things were really good. I knew I had the two-year deal. Um, I tried to do the best I could with it, but I started making plans at that point for my future. Yeah. Well, that's smart. More guys need to do that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. not enough talent, too. Well, Chuck, yeah. uh, I'm so glad uh, we got to just kind of lightly touch on on what you've done in the business there. I feel like yeah. another time we can we can dive into some other, some other stuff. Um, but real happy to hear all the things that you're up to right now, man. Uh, I'm very excited to check out Chuck of all trades and, and see what you're up to here with the the house flipping and the and the mechanics and everything like that. Uh, sure. What do you want to plug, promote, put over here to to wrap up the interview today? Sure. Just, well, the only social media I have is my Instagram. So my Instagram is simply uh, Chuck Palumbo. And that's where you'll get the latest stuff from me. Um, that's where I share most of my stuff. And then if you can continue to um, subscribe to Chuck of All Trades on YouTube, and that will continue to grow. It's small right now. Um, it's not. It's no big time show, but it's it's growing little by little. And uh, I appreciate. I just I appreciate. You know, anytime people are genuinely interested in what someone is doing, and they watch you, that's a gift. So, and I'm very thankful for that. So. Let's keep it going. Hold that on.